Welcome to part two of the Written by Rich Hosek podcast presentation of Near Death, a Rainy Day Investigation. This unabridged audio edition is presented as a prelude to the upcoming release of the next book in the series, After Life. So, make sure to follow the authors, Rich Hosek, Arnold Rudnick, and Lloyd Auerbach on Amazon, using the links in this episode's description to be notified when it's available. Until then, enjoy the following chapters of Near Death. Chapter 2. The police car went airborne for a second and a half when it crested the top of the hill. The blaring siren and flashing blue and white lights mounted on the dashboard gave just enough warning to the other cars and pedestrians in its path to get out of the way. The passenger, Detective Nate Rainey, sat passively as if this was a Sunday drive in the country. He wore a bespoke suit with a clean white shirt and a silk tie that gave him the look of someone older than the thirty-odd years he'd been kicking around. The driver was a stark contrast to Nate. Max Lee was a younger Asian man. His hair was spiked in place with gel, and a sparse week's worth of beard covered parts of his chin, jawline, and upper lip. He wore a sport coat, but it clearly was something off the rack. And the t-shirt he wore underneath it declared that he would wear the jacket, but screw the tie. His eyes had the look of a maniac on a mission. You know, Nate said to his partner, you're really not supposed to use the siren unless we're on official business. Yeah, I think you've mentioned that before. But I remind you, we are on official business, Max insisted. We're buying a birthday present for the captain. Doesn't get any more official than that. Nate sighed, knowing better than to argue with the headstrong detective. He was a good cop who had just seen one too many lethal weapon movies. That's the place up there, Nate told him, pointing to a storefront for a high-end gift shop. Got it, Max said. You see any parking spaces? Kind of hard to tell while you're going 60 miles per hour. Never mind, I see one. Max cut the wheel hard to the left, swinging the back of the car around and sliding it into a spot on the opposite side of the street. Nate reached over and killed the siren and lights. You are one police procedure savvy citizen away from a disciplinary hearing. I had a girlfriend once who was in a discipline. She was hot. Not at all the same thing, Nate said as he got out of the car. I wonder if I still have her number. Max unbuckled himself, then stepped out of the car right into traffic. Seymour Bertrand, a heavyset man in his forties with greasy hair attempting to cover a bowling head, slammed on the brakes. His passenger, Freddie Harding, thinner, older, and with a military-style buzz cut, nearly slammed into the windshield. Hey, watch it, Freddie complained. It's not my fault some asshole just walked into the middle of traffic. And I told you to wear your seatbelt. We don't want to get pulled over for some stupid traffic violation. Whatever. Let's just do this job and pay off Deucey and get the hell out of the city. Hell, the state! Yeah, I'm with you on that. That guy's leaving. It's perfect. Seymour waited for a car just ahead of them to pull out from its parking space and gently ease the old Cadillac into the spot. He turned off the car but left the key in the ignition. It wasn't on a keychain, so it was hard to see that the key was there and unlikely that someone would jack it while they were inside. Both men wore long, bulky overcoats that hid shoulder holsters, keeping their glocks at the ready. Remember, Seymour told his partner, watches, wallets, phones, and rings. We don't have time for anything else. We've got four minutes tops once we have their attention. Yeah, yeah, I know. Remember, I'm the one who found this job. High-end merch, lots of fat wallet tourists, and rich assholes from the financial district. You want a medal? One more time. What's the approach? I know what to do, Freddy assured him. His partner stared at him. Freddy relented and answered Seymour's question. You go in the front, I'll enter through the back. What do you say if someone asks what you're doing back there? Fred repeated his reluctantly memorized line. I'm picking up my girlfriend who works there. Seymour was not impressed. Let's just hope they believe you would actually have a girlfriend. I could say boyfriend if that would make you feel better. Maybe even less likely to believe you're gay. I got this, Freddy insisted. You do your part, I'll do mine. All right, you go first. I'll hide out in a minute. Whatever. Freddy stepped out of the car, then reached into the back seat and pulled out a large empty duffel bag. He shut the door, then walked up to the corner, crossed the street, and made his way to the alley behind the shops. Seymour took a deep breath. This is the last time I work with that guy, he promised himself. In the shop, Nate browsed an assortment of gadgets lined up on a table in the middle of the store. He picked up a GPS-enabled watch, tapped at its screen, and pressed its buttons. Max walked up behind him, slapped both hands on Nate's shoulders, nearly causing his partner to drop the watch. No gadgets, buddy. That's your thing, not hers. She runs. Might like something to keep track of where she's going. Partner, that lady knows exactly where she's going, and its initials are City Hall. Not initials, Max. Did you even go to school? 
School of Hard Knocks, my friend. The street was my school. Say, what's the budget on this gift? The squad kicked in just over $600. Wow. I say we take half, get massages and a couple of rare steaks, and get her a gift card. Classy, Nate replied. Just a thought. We can spend it all on the captain if that's what you really want to do. Yes, that's what I and the rest of the squad want to do. All right, just asking, Max said. Something across the room caught his eye. Hey, what about those? He indicated some hammered copper planters. Planners? Don't chicks like plants? First of all, the captain is not a chick. She is our superior officer. And second, over my dead body. Relax. Anyone ever told you you're uptight, Nate? Just you, Max. Just you. I'd listen to me. I do, and I'm a pretty happy guy. I think I'll stick with common sense, respect for others, and obeying regulations. All right. Let's keep looking. Max checked out an assortment of collectible figurines. Nate noticed a heavyset man enter the store. He wore a bulky overcoat, but it still fit him tightly enough that Nate thought he could make out the familiar outlines of the straps from a shoulder holster. The man scanned the store, checking out the customers rather than the merchandise. Oh shit, Nate said to himself, hoping he was wrong. Max? He whispered, Max. You find something? Max asked. Guy in the overcoat by the front door. Looks like he might be casing the joint. For what? Max caught a glimpse of the fat guy. Oh yeah, he's not here for the planners. Nate looked around. Big place. You need at least two people to pull it off. Yeah, a partner would make sense. Call it in. Get some backup over here. Max pulled out his phone. Not in here, Nate told him. I don't want to scare anyone or tip them off. Take it outside. If you don't see anything, circle around back. Okay, boss. I'm on it. Max made his way to the front of the store, passing the heavyset man on his way. The man watched Max leave, then reached inside his coat. Nate turned his attention to the back of the store and saw a second man, much thinner, wearing an identical coat and carrying a duffel bag, emerge from the employee's only door. On second thought, Max, Nate said to himself in a low voice, why don't you wait here with me in case this thing goes down right now? Seymour pulled out his gun and fired a shot into the air. It was a dramatic move, but in his experience it scared the shit out of everyone around him and scared people made terrible witnesses and generally did what they were told. Freddy fired his gun as well, adding confusion to the fear, effectively causing everyone who thought about fleeing out the back of the store to freeze in place. Sorry to inconvenience anyone, Seymour announced, but this is a robbery. If you do what we say, you could be on your way quickly and alive. If you don't, I can't make that promise. Everyone, get into the center of the store, form a line. No one moved. Seymour fired another shot into the air, and the shoppers hurried to gather haphazardly between the two gunmen. Seymour knew the gunshots would cause someone to call the police, but all of that was anticipated. They would have what they wanted and be out the door in less than three minutes, half the average response time for this neighborhood. Nate considered reaching for his gun, but without backup and a store full of civilians, that scenario just did not play. Instead, he mingled with the other shoppers waiting for backup. Since Max hadn't come bursting back in with his gun drawn, he assumed he was still making his way to the rear entrance, unaware that the situation had escalated. Nate slipped his phone out of his jacket pocket and started tapping out a message to Max on the screen. Hey, you, the skinny man said, tapping Nate on the shoulder with his gun. He held out his oversized gym bag. Let's have that. Nate managed to hit the send button as he dropped the phone in the bag. Get in line, the skinny man ordered. Nate fell in line with the others, positioning himself in the middle. Come on, shoulder to shoulder, no funny business. Have your phones, wallets, watches, and rings ready when I walk by. As the skinny one walked along the line, collecting everyone's personal possessions, the fat one watched over them from the opposite side. Smart. With everyone lined up shoulder to shoulder, if anyone made a move, he could easily see it. Nate was glad that no one so far was stupid enough to try to be a hero. The skinny guy reached Nate. All right, let's have the rest of it. Nate stripped off his watch, confident the gift he had received from his great uncle when he graduated from the police academy would soon be back in his possession, and dropped it in the bag. He pulled out his wallet and added it, too. When it landed, it popped open, revealing the detective's shield inside. Freddy saw a flash when the guy in the nice suit dropped his wallet in the bag. He looked inside and saw a gold badge affixed to the black leather wallet. He looked back at the guy who smiled awkwardly. No need to do anything crazy. I want to get out of here with no one getting hurt as much as you guys do. Freddy dropped the bag and held his Glock on Nate with both hands. We got a cop! He shouted to Seymour. Shit, does he have a gun? I don't know. I guess so. He's a cop. And he spoke to Nate. Put your hands up, slowly. 
Seymour walked over behind the line of frightened shoppers to join his partner. When he reached the cop, he patted him down and found his gun in a shoulder holster. He pulled it out and tossed it in the bag. Any more? No, the cop promised. But Seymour continued to pat him down, checking his waistband and his ankles. Shit, what do we do now? Freddy asked. Stick with the plan. Get the rest of this stuff and we're out of here. Freddy nodded, picked the bag back up, and continued walking down the line accepting each person's valuables, speeding up the process by making threatening gestures with his gun. A siren wailed in the distance. They're early, Seymour cursed. Let's get out of here. Freddy spied the gold locket hanging around a young woman's neck. It looked like it had some rather decent-sized diamonds in it. Let's have that, he insisted. The woman put a hand to her chest to cover the locket. No, please, it's very special to me. Then I'll be sure to take very special care of it, Freddy promised. He ran his thumb over the top of the locket. As he brushed over a latch, it popped open, revealing a photo of a baby inside. That's my baby, the woman pleaded. I wouldn't brag about that, Freddy replied. He snatched it from her neck. The clasp didn't break easily, and it pulled her forward, knocking her off balance. Hey, give that back, said a young man, who was obviously the woman's companion. Freddy couldn't remember if they had put wedding rings in the bag or not. Shut up, Freddy said, then whipped his gun across the young man's face, momentarily dazing him. Let's go, Seymour shouted. Freddy shifted his attention to his partner, and that was all the young man needed to make his move. He lunged at Freddy, knocking him to the ground. The duffel bag of valuables spilled half of its contents. Freddy's gun went off. The young woman screamed. Nate reached for his gun before remembering it was no longer tucked away in his shoulder holster. He raced toward the two men who were struggling on the floor. A shot from the front of the store rang out, and Nate could hear it zip past his head, missing him by inches. Stay where you are, the fat man warned. Nate froze. Let's go, asshole, the fat guy yelled at his partner. The skinny guy managed to elbow the young man on the side of the head, tossed him aside, and scrambled to his feet. He kicked the man on the ribs, then grabbed the bag. Freeze! Police! Max yelled from the back of the store. Nate looked to his partner. He opened his jacket and showed him the empty holster. Max realized his mistake. Instead of he and Nate having the upper hand, he was now outnumbered. The skinny guy fired at Max, causing him to retreat. A siren sounded like it was still a couple blocks away. Come on, shouted the fat guy. Nate had to give him credit. He obviously wasn't pleased with his partner's screw-up, but wasn't going to leave the man behind, and knew they only had seconds left to make an escape. The skinny guy scrambled to pick up the spilled valuables. Leave it, the fat guy ordered. The skinny guy reluctantly grabbed what he could and turned toward the front of the store while the fat guy held his gun on the customers. Both of them were now on the other side of the civilians from Max, who couldn't possibly have a clear shot. Then, Nate's worst fear materialized. The young man, who moments ago lay incapacitated on the floor, was now getting to his feet. His hand found a heavy paperweight, and he picked it up and hurled it at the skinny guy as he ran toward the door. It hit him square between the shoulder blades. In a moment of blind rage, the skinny man swung his gun around toward the young man. You stupid mother... Forget him! The fat man shouted, let's go! But Nate could see in the skinny guy's eyes that he would not let it go. Nate took two giant steps, then launched himself into the air. A shot rang out. Nate smashed into the young man, taking them both to the floor. A sudden pain burned in Nate's chest. He must have landed funny. Nate! Max shouted from the back of the store. Nate looked to the front entrance and saw the two men exchange a few words as they fled out onto the street. Nate got to his knees. It took a lot more effort than it should have. Max rushed to his side, put his arms around Nate to steady him. Easy there, partner. Just lie down. I'm fine. Just had the wind knocked out of me. He looked into Max's eyes. The Asian man's bravado was gone, replaced with fear. You're shot, Nate. Lie down. Nate looked down at the spot on his chest that now burned as if someone was sticking a red-hot poker into it. There was a hole in his suit, surrounded by a growing spot of blood. He suddenly felt dizzy and allowed Max to lower him to the floor. Someone call 911, he said. Tell them there's an officer down. No one moved. Sounds like they're already on the way, someone said. That's just more cops. I need an ambulance. They took our phones, one of the other shoppers told him. Max pulled out his own phone and tossed it to the shopper. He returned his attention to Nate, peeled back his jacket to inspect the wound. Blood pumped out in weak spurts. Max placed his hands over the wound and applied a hard, steady pressure. Stay with me, Nate. Hang on, he pleaded. You were right, Nate said. Right about what? 
We should have gotten a gift card. Max laughed. Nate felt the world fading away. His eyes closed and his head fell to one side. Chapter 3 Nate looked down at the street. Wait, that wasn't right. He couldn't have been looking down because he was lying on a stretcher being rushed out of the gift shop. One paramedic was pushing the gurney while a second was astride Nate pressing down on a stack of blood-soaked gauze over the wound in his chest. Yet somehow he was watching it all happen. Get him to county. I've got an escort for you and the trauma team is waiting, Max ordered the paramedics. You got it, one of them replied. Max put his phone to the side of his head. He's on his way, Cap. I'll meet you at the hospital. Someone should call his mother. He ended the call and stopped to watch the paramedics slide Nate into the back of the ambulance. He ran a hand through his spiked hair and turned away. Nate knew that Max, despite his current outward appearance and action, was lost. He was taking control of the situation because he had lost control of his feelings. His partner had just been shot and the poor kid was probably blaming himself, replaying the scene in his head a hundred different ways, trying to figure out how he could have stopped something that had already happened. Wasn't your fault, Nate said, or rather thought. No one seemed to react to his words. The street grew brighter, as if someone had shined a huge spotlight on it. No one else seemed to notice. Nate looked behind him and saw a bright light. It wasn't blindingly bright, but rather inviting and comforting. He wanted to go toward it, to go into it. For a moment, he thought he saw a shape in front of the light, a silhouette, and heard someone saying, faintly, Not now. He turned away. The cop at him took over. He searched the street for any sign of the two gunmen. They were probably long gone, but he felt a strong drive, a powerful need to find them. Oddly, he realized he didn't so much want to find them for himself, but so that Max could be at peace. The ambulance arrived at the trauma center, and a team was waiting to transfer Nate from the stretcher to a hospital gurney. They wheeled him inside while the paramedics fed information about their patients' vitals to the doctors and nurses. Take him directly to surgery, one doctor ordered. They're waiting for him. The trauma team raced through a series of doors, each held open by a nurse or orderly so that their progress to the elevator was unimpeded. The ride up to the third floor surgery suites took longer than any of them liked. Another cleared path was waiting for them when they exited the elevator, and he was handed off to the surgery team. The lead doctor inspected the wound. Let's get some more blood on him right away. He's going to need it. A portable x-ray machine gave them a look at what they were dealing with. The bright white lead of the bullet lay just a fraction of an inch from his heart. Lucky son of a bitch, he's got a chance. Nate watched the doctor open his chest while a nurse suctioned away excess blood. Clamps were applied to vessels as they dug their way down through the flesh to where the bullet that killed him sat. Killed him was the right way to think about it, Nate realized. He was dead. Wasn't he? The pain from the gunshot wound was gone, though. That could be the anesthesia. Maybe there was a mirror above the operating table, and he was one of those rare patients who was awake during surgery, but paralyzed and unable to speak. Got it, the doctor announced, and dropped the bullet into a waiting tray with a solid clink. The operating room team knew what to do next. They sealed it into an evidence bag they kept on hand for just such occasions, and a nurse walked it out of the operating room and handed it to a police detective who had watched the entire process and could and would verify the chain of custody in a court of law. Let's get his heart started. Paddles, the doctor ordered. A nurse handed him the small, thin defibrillator paddles used on an exposed heart. The doctor placed them carefully inside Nate's chest. Clear, he said, and pressed the small button that applied the electric shock. Nate's heart jumped, but didn't beat. Okay, again. Clear, the doctor ordered. Another surge of electricity flowed through the paddles into Nate's heart, and this time it started beating. The doctor waited patiently, observing the EKG screen as the jagged but regular lines from Nate's heartbeat traced across it. Then they stopped, and the steady beats of his heart changed to a flat tone. The doctor looked inside Nate's chest. We have another blader, he said dispassionately. Suction. The room grew bright. Again, Nate turned and saw the light beckoning him, promising peace. He could see the shadowy figure more clearly now. There was something familiar about it. Nate fought the compulsion to move toward the shape into the light and turned away from it. He found himself once again on the street in front of the gift shop. No, not on the street, above it. He heard a familiar voice, the frustrated tones of the fat guy from the robbery. A cop. You shot a cop, you idiot. We are so screwed. Nate turned around, but the robber was nowhere in sight. 
he realized that he wasn't in front of the store anymore. He was in a decidedly different neighborhood. It looked like somewhere in the Tenderloin District. He was in front of a house with an unkempt yard, bordered by a low stone fence and a decades-old Cadillac parked under a carport that had no roof. He looked at the car, thinking there was something he should do, something a cop would do. I wasn't aiming for the cop, asshole, the skinny guy said. Oh, well, as long as you weren't trying to kill him, I'm sure they'll just let the whole thing go. Nate followed the sound of the voices, but it wasn't like they were nearby. It was as if he could hear through the walls. He looked at the house, searching for a way in other than the front door. Then he was inside, looking at the fat guy and his skinny partner. The fat guy was pacing nervously, while the skinny one was sorting the take from the robbery. Should have stayed and grabbed the rest of the loot. This isn't enough. I say we fence it and get out of town, the skinny guy said. Cops are going to be putting pressure on every fence in the city. No one's going to want to handle this stuff. It might as well be radioactive. Then we leave town and fence it out of state. And if Deuce gets wind that we slipped out of town without paying him, cops will be the least of our worries. Besides, we can't show our faces right now. Why not? You said those suckers in the store would be so scared they wouldn't be able to give a decent description. Yeah, they can't, but that other cop can. They're trained for that shit. I certainly can, Nate said. But neither man heard him. So we wait a couple of weeks, grow beards. I let my hair grow, you shave yours off, maybe drop a few pounds. It'll be fine. The fat man shook his head, then dropped down on the sofa and covered his face with his hands. He opened his mouth and beeped. The skinny man beeped back at him. Nate looked around, wondering what the hell was going on. Only now he was back in the operating room where the EKG was beeping on a steady rhythm. Got him back, the doctor announced. The other doctors and nurses sighed with relief. Chapter 4 Jennifer admired the poster of Harry Houdini mounted on the wall of her office. It hung behind her desk, displacing dozens of other photos, diplomas, and various examples of indigenous art she had collected during her travels, all of which were now stacked on top of a pair of file cabinets. It mirrored another poster hanging across from it. In this one, there was a picture of a woman identified as the mysterious professor, Jennifer's alter ego. A variety of magical accoutrements floated around her while she stared straight ahead with just a hint of a mischievous smile. It had been years since she had performed professionally. The demands of teaching left little time for it to be more than a hobby now. Emily Vargas, a young undergrad, borderline goth, walked in. She froze in place when she saw the eerie face of the master magician staring at her. That is so creepy, she said, and not in a fun way. No, it's not, insisted Jennifer. It is most awesome. PTW, no one says awesome anymore. Awesome sauce? Jennifer inquired. Not even, Emily replied. Well, I like it. He's one of my heroes and he's staying. I thought Mary Leakey was your hero. I said one of them. Did you read your messages? Emily asked. No, that's your job. Yes, I read them and then I leave the important ones for you to read so you can respond and make sure the dean doesn't fire you. That's ridiculous. Why would he fire me? The dean loves me. Actually, I don't think that's accurate. Emily dropped the newspaper on her desk. It was open to a story with the headline, Local Ghostbuster Exercises Spirits from Historic Palace Theater. And I know he doesn't like it when you associate the university with your side hustle. Jennifer looked at the article and smiled. I'm glad Victor got some publicity out of the whole thing. Maybe he'll be able to keep the place going. Though I wish they wouldn't refer to it as an exorcism. It wasn't even really a spirit. They put spirits in quotes, Emily pointed out. Jennifer glanced back down at the newspaper. Still, quite a lot of editorial license in that headline. Then another story caught her eye. Local cop recovering after shootout. She skimmed the article, which focused mostly on the fact that the perpetrators were still at large. But she did find, buried in the final paragraphs, what she was looking for. Surgeons managed to save the detective's life after his heart had stopped repeatedly on the operating table. Yes, she exclaimed excitedly. What is it now? Emily asked. Possible NDE, Jennifer replied. Oh, God, Emily droned. They're never going to let you in to see him. I need more cases for the book, she insisted. Besides, you'll be there to help me. I have classes over the next three days. Finals are next week, and I have a major paper due in your class. Jennifer scribbled a large A on a pad of paper and ripped off the sheet and handed it to Emily. I loved your paper. It was well-reasoned, carefully researched, and the grammar was spectacular. We'll go on Friday. He just had major surgery. We should give him a couple of days to rest. You think? Emily asked sarcastically. 
Then she handed the A back to Jennifer. I'm going to write that paper. I like writing papers. It's fun. I like doing research. That's why I like you, Emily. You like doing the things I don't have time for. Chapter 5 Nate opened his eyes. Judging from the smell, the television set high up in one corner playing an episode of Judge Judy, and flowers and balloons crowded around the perimeter of the room, he guessed he was in a hospital. The sensation of an elephant sitting on his chest reminded him why. He had been shot. And then he had had that strange dream, one he wanted to forget. A soft, gentle hand squeezed his own. Nate looked to his right and saw the smiling yet concerned face of his mother, Eleanor. He tried to speak, to say something comforting to her, but he realized he couldn't. There was a breathing tube down his throat. Don't try to talk, she said to him. I'll call the nurse. She reached over to the panel on the bed and pressed the button marked call. You had me worried for a while, but then I spoke to your father, and he told me everything was going to be all right. It's not your time, she said to him. Nate rolled his eyes and shook his head slowly, moving it at all, hurt like hell. His father, Ben, had been dead for 15 years now, but his mother spent a good portion of his social security benefits and her own meager teacher's pension on psychics and mediums who convinced her they could speak to him. It was a constant struggle between his mother and him. The nurse entered and walked over to Nate with a broad smile on her face. Welcome back, detective, she said cheerily. How are you feeling? Nate offered her a 45-degree thumbs up. Let me talk to the doctor, she said. I'll see if we can get that tube out. Nate nodded slowly, his eyes signaling his eagerness. The nurse checked his pulse with her warm, slender fingers, an act that was unnecessary since he was hooked up to multiple machines that could give her that information. By the way, I'm Izzy. I'll be right back, she promised. Once she left the room, Eleanor leaned in to Nate and whispered, I think she likes you. Nate's status as an unmarried, childless man was the other topic of conversation that generated conflict between him and his mother. The nurse returned with a small cart and started unstrapping the ventilator mask. Hey, look who's awake, said Max's exuberant voice from the doorway. He noticed Eleanor sitting at the bedside and stepped over and put a comforting hand on her shoulder. How's he doing, Mrs. R? He's awake, she said. The nurse proceeded to remove the breathing tube from Nate. He tried to speak, but ended up coughing instead. It may be difficult to talk for a little while. Do you have a sore throat? Izzy asked. Nate shook his head. He cleared his throat and turned to Max. My rabbit ate 22 Easter eggs. What? asked Max, confused. What? Nate answered, equally confused. You said your rabbit ate some eggs. You have a rabbit? Did you get a pet, dear? Eleanor asked. What are you two talking about? I asked if you caught the bastards who shot me. Sometimes the anesthesia does funny things, Izzy offered. Max shook off his confusion. Okay, my bad. We haven't captured them yet, but every cop in the city is on it. We'll get them. Nate nodded. A doctor entered and stepped up to the bed. Hello there, Detective Rainey. I'm Dr. Cullen. Nate recognized him as a doctor he saw in the operating room in what he remembered as a foggy dream. Have we met before? Nate asked. First time I saw you was when I pulled a bullet out of your chest. You gave us quite a scare. Thought we lost you a couple of times on the operating table, but you kept coming back. Thank you for saving my son, Eleanor said. From what I hear, he was the hero, the doctor added. He turned back to Nate. From one to ten, how is the pain? Nate considered the question. The pain in his chest was constant, but as he tried to lift his right arm, he realized it was in a sling. A sharp twinge shot through his shoulder. He winced. I was going to say five, but I think I just bumped it up to an eight, he answered hoarsely. The doctor gently positioned Nate back on the bed, adjusting his arm to an angle that offered immediate relief to the discomfort. When the bullet entered your chest, it essentially split into two fragments. One ended up about two millimeters from your heart. The other ended up in your shoulder. We removed it, but you're going to need some additional surgery before you can experience the kind of mobility you had before. The words took a moment to sink in. Nate shot a look to Max, who looked away. He, too, knew the consequences of what the doctor said. Nate's right arm was his shooting arm. If he couldn't qualify in the range, he would be removed from active duty. They both knew fellow officers who had experienced career-ending injuries. Putting it into perspective, Nate knew he was lucky to be alive. But the prospect of sitting behind a desk for the rest of his career was not appealing. Thank you, doctor, was all Nate could manage to say. But the disappointment in his voice was apparent to everyone in the room. All right, everyone, Izzy announced. He needs rest. I'll make sure the orthopedist stops by to explain things to you more completely, the doctor assured him. Come on, Mrs. R, let me take you to lunch, 
Max offered. Eleanor considered, then turned to Izzy. Will you take care of my boy while I'm gone? Absolutely, Izzy promised. Eleanor stood and took Max's proffered arm. Then I accept your kind offer, she said. Don't worry, Nate, I'll be a gentleman, Max assured his partner. Why start now? Nate asked sarcastically. Max escorted Eleanor out of the room. The doctor offered Nate a reassuring nod and followed them out. Izzy made one last check and positioned the remote with the call button near his left hand. Let me know if you need anything. Nate nodded. Two thoughts swirled in his mind. First, the men who shot him were still at large. And second, he would likely not be able to participate in tracking them down. In one moment, his life had changed direction. The question remaining was where that change would lead him. Thank you for listening to part two of Near Death, a rainy day investigation on the Written by Rich Hosick podcast. Near Death was written by Rich Hosick, Arnold Rudnick, and Lloyd Auerbach. I hope you're enjoying the audio version of this novel. Please leave a review on Amazon or Audible, and stay tuned for more chapters in this thrilling paranormal mystery in the coming weeks. Also, make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast app or download these episodes on Audible. Give me a like or five stars and a quick review. And most importantly, share Near Death and my weekly audio short stories with your friends or anyone who enjoys audio books. You can find out more about the Rainy Day Investigation book series at rainyandday.com. That's R-A-N-E-Y and D-A-Y-E dot com. You can also follow me on Twitter at Rich Hosick. Give us a like on Facebook at Rainy and Day. And don't forget to check out my books on Amazon and follow me there to make sure you get notified of when Book 2, Afterlife, is released. Thanks again, and all the very best.